There are some verses in the Bible that are very familiar to most of us. We may not know exactly where they're found, but we do know that they're there. And it is interesting that some of those words and some of those thoughts have found their way into our culture and that they're quoted by people who may not even know that they're quoting from the Bible. They may never have even read the Bible. One passage like that is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You know that passage. In that we are told that God has ordained and he has structured every event in his universe, every event in our lives, according to his divine timetable. We live and move and breathe according to his plan for us. And so we are told there in that passage that there is a time to be born. There is a time to die. There is a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to be silent. And there is a time to speak. There's a time to love and a time to hate. There is a time. There is a season for everything under heaven. We know that passage. And so according to his plan... For us, our lives move from one season to the next. And as we come to John chapter 13, Jesus has moved from one season into another season. In fact, this is the final season of his life here on earth before he will suffer and die for us. For over 30 years, he walked on this earth and he lived in obedience to God, his Father. He glorified his name. He preached the truth of the word of God. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He called on people to turn from their sin and to turn to God, to turn to him and be saved. But at the end of John chapter 12, it says something very interesting. It says he departed from the people. He left them and he was hidden from them. Even though he had walked among them for so long, still, they didn't believe him. Their eyes were blinded. Their hearts were hardened. Their time was over. Their season was gone. And so it is today. As it says in Hebrews chapter 3, Today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart in unbelief because God will not always strive with men and there will come a time when you may not be able to hear his voice. And for those who saw Jesus, who heard his words, who saw God in the flesh walking right before them, their time was gone. Their season was over. Jesus was no longer walking among them. There is a time, there is a season for everything on this earth. And so beginning in John chapter 13, through chapter 17. Jesus focuses not on the people, not on the multitudes, but he focuses on his closest disciples. Twelve men. Twelve men that he had chosen to represent him. And eleven of them would continue to do that even after Jesus had ascended to heaven. So in chapter 13, it begins, and we find Jesus and his 12 disciples in Jerusalem. For several years, he had told them. He had said to them, I must go to Jerusalem. He had told them, that is the place where I will be crucified and die. But they were blind to that truth. So just hours before he is about to suffer. 
He wanted to share one last meal with them. One last time of fellowship. One last opportunity to prepare them for what he was about to endure and how it would affect them. With the weight of all that was about to come upon him, the weight of all of our sin, Jesus thinks of them. And so they arrived at the place where they were to share this special time together. We are told it was in a large, furnished upper room. In Luke 22, verse 24, uh, Luke gives us some insight into what was going on in the minds of the disciples. We're told that there was some tension between them. There was a disagreement among them. The disagreement was concerning who was the greatest, who was the most important disciple among them. The time when they should have been focused on Jesus, on his suffering, they were focused on themselves. And so we're told, verse 1, it was a Thursday night, the night before he would be crucified, the time, it says, before the feast of the Passover. And that was the last true Passover that would ever be celebrated. It was the time that each year the nation of Israel celebrated their deliverance from their captivity in Egypt. They remembered how the angel of death passed over their houses, the houses of all of those who obeyed God's command to place the blood of a lamb on their door so that their firstborn would be spared. But now, the true Lamb of God had come. He was among them. So Jesus, it says, knowing, oida, having knowledge, but not like we have knowledge. How do we get knowledge? We learn it, right? We acquire knowledge over time. But Jesus has all knowledge. He has all understanding. He knows all things. He knows all things without ever having to have learned them. He knew, it says, his hour, his aura. His moment of time had come. Erkoma, it had arrived. From eternity past, this moment was forever in the heart of God. The time when the Son would give his life for his wicked, rebellious creation, when he would give his life for us. A time that was established before time began. And even though we are told his soul was troubled, no one, he said in John 10, would take his life from him. He would give his life. He would lay down his life. And then it says he would take it up again. It was for this hour, we are told, that he had come into this world. He would die He would rise from the grave, and then it says he would depart out of this world, and he would return to the Father from where he had come. His going forth has been from eternity, we are told by Micah. Micah 5, 2. So now, this moment has arrived. He's about to leave this world. He's about to return to heaven, to return to the glory that has been forever his. All power, all authority, all worship of all of heaven given to God, our Savior, to Jesus, our Lord. And so, having loved his own, it says, Idios, his dear ones, 
His disciples. Us. Those who he says were in the world. Those who would remain there. Even after he was gone to heaven. It says he loved them to the end. Eistelos in Greek. He loved them beyond measure. He loved them through everything. He loved them with an everlasting love. He loved them not to the end. He loved them without end. That's how he loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He loves us without end. He loves us through everything. He loves us through all of the difficulties in our life. And so it was during supper, verse 2 says. That's when these things took place. During this meal. The devil, the diabolos, the slanderer, Satan, the enemy of our souls. The enemy of God. The one who never ceases to work against the truth. He had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. He had put it in his heart, Balo. He had poured his lies into the mind of Judas. He had used the sin of Judas, his greed, to influence him. That's what the enemy does. He uses our sin to influence us and take us in the wrong direction. And we are told he influenced Judas to betray Christ. Paradidomai, to hand him over to his enemies. To those who wanted to kill Jesus. And for what? For what? Matthew 26, 15 says, for 30 pieces of silver. You know, that was the price to buy a slave. The price to buy a slave is what was given to Judas to betray the God of glory. And before Judas had sat down at that table for supper, he had already negotiated that transaction. Judas had spent three years with Jesus. Judas saw his sin- sinless life. He heard his words of, of grace. He heard his teaching. No one had ever taught like Jesus taught. Even the temple guard said that. He saw Jesus perform miracles that no one but God could have performed. He saw people's lives changed. He saw the love of Christ right before his eyes and still he did not believe. Still he betrayed Jesus. And by doing that, he made an agreement with hell. Have I not chosen you, Jesus said in John 6, 70, as he addressed his disciples? He said, and yet one of you is a devil. From the beginning, Jesus knew all about Judas. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Judas was never truly a disciple. He never really loved Jesus. He never believed in him. The Lord knows those who are. His. He knows his own. So let us examine our heart. Let us see if we are truly in the faith. Because the hour has come for us. The table has been set before us. And Jesus, verse 3, says, knowing all things, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, all authority is given to me, Jesus said in Matthew 28, both in heaven and on earth, it's all his. He knew that he had come forth from God. And he knew, it says, that he was going 
back to God. He is the creator. He is the sustainer of the universe. He is God himself who dwelt among us. Our Savior. So what happened next is even more amazing knowing who he is. Verse 4 says that he rose from supper. He got up from the table. The table that would have been used that night was shaped like like a, the letter U, like a horseshoe. And the host of the feast would sit at the central point of that table, where the table made the curve. And the table was close to the floor, so the guests would lie on something that looked like a couch, with their, their left elbow on the table, and with their body behind the table, so their feet were accessible for washing. The streets were dusty, they were dirty, and everyone wore sandals. So they needed to wash their feet often. And when you went to someone's house for a meal, the first thing that they would do, the host would have a slave wash your feet. But not even a Hebrew slave was required to do that. Because the task was considered so degrading that they would have a Gentile slave perform that task. It was considered the lowest level of service. But there were no servants at this supper. There were no slaves. There were only the disciples. And not one of them had offered to wash anyone's feet. Not even their Lord's feet. And so Jesus rose from supper. His divine glory is about to be expressed by his divine love. The lowest level of humble service is about to be elevated to the highest level of love. And so it says in verse 4, he, he laid aside tithemai. He, he removed, he took off his, his garments, his hithatim, his, his outer garment, his robe. And where's Judas? Judas is at the table. Judas is there with the other disciples. And perhaps... That night he was sitting just to the left of Jesus in the place of honor. In the place of the guest of honor. Why do we know that? Verse 26 says that Jesus gave him the unleavened bread that had been dipped in the herbs. That was an honor that was given to the guest of honor at a feast. So Jesus is about to wash the feet of the man who would betray him with a kiss in a matter of hours. But Jesus considered him the guest of honor. He reached out to him one last time. Jesus knows what what is about to happen. He knows everything. But in Matthew 5, 44, what did he tell us? He said to love our enemies. And how? How are we to love them? He says to love them not only in word, but love them by your actions. He's about to demonstrate that. And so it says in verse 4, taking a towel, a lention, long, long linen cloth, he girded himself about. Diazonumai. He tied it around his waist with enough left to do what he was about to do. So it says he poured water into a basin. And he began to wash Nipto. He began to cleanse the disciples' feet. And then to, to wipe them, ekmas, to dry them with the towel with which he was girded. 
And we're not told that anyone, anyone at that table said anything. No one said a word as he went from disciple to disciple. And he washed their feet. It was perhaps only the silence of amazement, maybe of embarrassment, maybe of shame, that they had not done what their Lord was willing to do for them. And so, verse 6 says, he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, You, Lord, Corios, Master, do you wash my feet? It's not right that you should do that. You are the king. And the king does not wash the feet of his subjects. Well, Jesus answered him with, with love and with patience. And he said to Peter, what I do, poieo, what I have shown you, you do not realize. You have not yet come to the place of spiritual awareness now, at this time. But, he says, you will understand what I have done hereafter, Meditauta. Later, afterwards, there'll come a time, a season, Peter, when you will understand. You will see. But Peter wasn't willing to submit to the Lord's assessment of the situation. He wasn't willing to listen to his words, to his foreknowledge. And Peter said to him, strong words, Alme, no, never, never will you wash my feet. This wasn't humility. This was disobedience. And Jesus answered him, verse 8, if I do not wash you, if you will not let go of your pride, and submit to me, then you have no part, miros, no portion, no share with me. There can be no fellowship between us. But Peter still didn't understand, did he? Because Simon Peter, verse 9, says this, Lord, not all, not my, my feet only, but also wash my hands. Wash my head. Sometimes we're better off just taking the Lord at his word, even if we don't understand it, aren't we? So that, then the Lord gave Peter and the disciples and us a picture, an illustration to help us understand. It is a story of a man who was uh, perhaps on the way to a feast, to a meal somewhere. And before he went out, he took a bath. But on the way to the feast, his, his feet got dirty again. So Jesus said in verse, verse 10, he said to Peter, He who has bathed, lelumenos, he who has washed his entire body, needs only to wash to cleanse his feet. Why? Because he says in verse 10, his body is still completely holos, entirely clean. Ah, Catharos, pure, innocent, spiritually clean. So this picture is more than just taking a bath, isn't it? This has some spiritual meaning, and it does, right? Because when we come to Christ, that is exactly what happens to us. We are bathed, we are washed because of the blood of Christ. We are forgiven, and the cross brings complete Spiritual cleansing. But like our feet that become dirty, we must continually come to Christ for daily cleansing, not for salvation. That has been accomplished once for all, right? But as we walk through this world, we pick up 
the dust and the dirt and the defilement of this world of sin along the way of our sin. We sometimes fall. We sometimes fail. We need cleansing. Work out your salvation, it said in Philippians chapter 2.12. Keep living to please the Lord. How, he said, live in fear, live in awe, live in reverence to God. With what? With trembling. At what? At his word. As we see ourselves in the light of scripture and our heart is broken and crushed. We need to see ourselves that way. And what will happen? We press on believing. Believing what? We believe that when we confess our sin to him, what happens? First John 1 John 1.9 It is like Jesus is washing our feet. Why is that? Because it says in that verse, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us our sins and to do what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He provides the daily foot washing for our daily sins. Amen. And to his disciples he said, verse 10, you're clean. You are clean. My sacrifice on the cross brings cleansing to you. But not all of you, verse 11. For it says he knew the one among them who was betraying him. The one who was about to hand him over to the enemy. The one who was still sitting at the table. The one whose feet he had just washed. Judas. A tear. A weed among the wheat. For this reason, Jesus said, not all of you are clean. Spiritually clean. And so, verse 12 says, when he had finished washing their feet, and he had taken up his garments, and he reclined at the table once again, Then he asked them a question. He said to them, do you know, Ginosko, do you perceive, do do you have any idea what I have done to you? The, The spiritual lesson, the real meaning of what I have just illustrated. Do we? Do we really understand? Jesus is about to give us Understanding. Verse 13, he says this. You call me, you confess that I am your, your teacher, your didaskalos, your instructor. You say that when I speak, I speak the very words of God. And you call me Lord, Kurios, master. Your master. He said, you are right. That is who I am. So then, follow this. If I then, the Lord and teacher, your Lord and teacher, if I have washed your feet, and you claim to follow me, you claim to be my disciples, then what should you do? He says, you ought to wash one another's feet. Ophilo. It is your obligation. It is your responsibility to do what? To do whatever is necessary to serve each other. For he says, I gave you an example, verse 15. A hupodigma, a figure. Something to copy, something to trace out in your life. So that you also should do, verse 15 says, as I did to you. Not what I did to you. As I did to you. Kathos in Greek. Follow my attitude in everything that you do. It's not so much about your feet. It's about your attitude. 
I have humbled myself before you. As your Lord, your Master, your Teacher, as God Almighty. Look what I have done for you. You should do the same to each other. Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 16, I am telling you something here that is of great importance. So listen carefully, he says. Listen carefully to what I say. A slave is not greater and more important than his master, is he? Well, of course not. He says, neither is the one who is sent as a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Well, of course You are my servants. You are my doulos, in Greek. My bond slaves. You belong to me. And I have sent you into this world to represent me. So there should be no pride. There should be no jealousy, no arrogance, no strife between you. Instead, care for each other the way that I have cared for you. Then you are my disciples. Over 30 years later, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Peter said this, Be clothed, gird yourself about with humility. I guess he finally got it, didn't he? That's a lesson that some of us, many of us are still learning. And if you know these things, Jesus said in verse 17, you are blessed what? If you know them? He says no. You are blessed if you do them. If you keep on living with this perspective, with this attitude, Because what? Because your life will begin to reflect me, Jesus says. They see you, they'll see me. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. That is how people will know that we're disciples. Didn't he tell us that? If we reflect him in our love for each other, if day by day and moment by moment we show that kind of love to each other, But what about Judas? I mean, after all that he had seen, after all that he had heard, after the way that Christ continued to reach out to him, his heart was still hardened. Like so many people today, he refused to come to Christ for forgiveness. So verse 27 of John 13 says, Satan entered into him. Judas was under his control. And then John gives us his final comment and says this in verse 30. He went out into the night. He went out into the darkness. He was filled with the darkness of his sin. His opportunity. His time, his season for salvation was gone. And he would forever be the guest of dishonor. May that not be true of us. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.